All right, so this is Sarah Scherf and I'm Rebecca Zolo and we are here today to talk about um, race and more specifically how can white people even more specifically white women um, support people of color um, in ways that are actually supportive and appropriate and with boundaries and sensitivity. So um, Sarah, I would like you to just talk a bit about how this conversation came up between us um, and, and why we feel this is an important conversation to have. Um, I honestly don't remember how it came up. I, rem I remember as we joined Esclepios together, I noticed some of the posts you had on your Facebook wall and I connect and I probably shared a bunch of them too. And I kind of felt like you understood the like frustrations around the black community because there's all this stuff happening black men are dying left and right and a lot of the white community doesn't seem to care but i saw like on your facebook that you cared you know it's not like you tried to like fix anything it was just like pointing things out and then i think we ended up talking a little bit about it uh a few weeks ago and then you shared this event that you had attended um which was really interesting of a conversation. I think uh, that that's what I remember. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I had uh, attended a webinar hosted by Dr. Amanda Kemp, um, which was really interesting and helpful. Um, um, Let me ask you this. What do you think is missing from the conversation as it's happening in the world right now? Mm -hmm. I've thought a lot about this and I don't know if people really agree, but like I have such a wide range of friends. I have white friends, I have black friends, and I have like every color in between if we were really to say color is a race um and like at the end of the day i feel that the black community needs to come together and rise together and grow together and work together from that aspect and then white men and women because or white men and white women allies help support that and amplify the voices of the black community and uh, helping them be able to express themselves, but then also turn back into their own community and be an ally and represent, or not represent, but just speak to the struggles that are happening. Because at the end of the day, from a psychological perspective, we often listen to people we connect to so like I could yell at some white guy who thinks that black men and black women don't deserve to be equal, but at the end of the, he's not going to listen to me because he already doesn't believe that I have, he already believes that I'm inferior because of my race. So I think it would be helpful for the majorities to be able to speak to that in an empathic sort of way and kind of put it into um, a digestible or understandable perspective for whoever that person is. And then also just like straight up across the board as a country, we should have no tolerance for discrimination, whether it's from hiring people, whether it's just blatant racism, um, like things like that, like as a whole, we should just join together and say, no, we're not going to support this. And that's the same, that's the same for all people of color, not just the black community, but African Americans are really the 
only group that was brought over here without their own choice and were enslaved and slavery in the US is was so much more violent and it, there was just there was more terror around it than any other slavery historical or history of slave times and that's something I learned from reading The Half Has Never Been Told. Like, they were tortured. Slave, the enslaved were tortured. And on top of that, in order to advance the, in the Industrial Revolution, the South actually advanced their own industry as well through pushing the enslaved harder and harder and harder to pick cotton. Cotton was the real driver that sped up the income of uh, what was produced in the plantations. And like in the book, people would go from like 30 barrels of uh, cotton a day to like 400 over a span of one year. And that was not because of ingenuity, it's because of the torture and force to do that or else you will be whipped <laughs> or you will be killed or body parts will be removed from you. So like, it's hard. Like, I'm not saying that every other race should fix us, you know, but I think that is a pretty big difference in why we are here today. Why half of my people are here today. I'm half black. I'm half white. And I think that's important. Like black people need to rise above that, which is a challenge because so many black folks are stuck in poverty or middle class. And it's just like all of these systemic things are keeping us down, which is absolutely true. But I think us internally, we have to have faith in ourselves and our abilities. And we have to learn to love ourselves to become better. This is like the longest answer ever. But then <laughs> other races need to support that in, in, a, in a realistic way as well. Um, what does that support look like aside from taking a no tolerance stance toward systemic discriminatory policies within institutions um, such as law, government, education, et cetera. Um, what does outside support, meaning from people who are white and or of other colors, um, what, what does support look like to you? Yeah. Support is being empathetic or empathic, which is hard to define in many ways, but just acknowledging the struggle that exists. The fear that I have, it's not every second of the day, but sometimes the thought crosses my mind that people might think that my daughter, who I gave birth to, was kidnapped by me because she's so pale. She looks pretty white and I'm not white. Um, that's a fear that I have. And I think that's a reasonable fear. And the thought or just me being uh, relieved to know that I had a daughter instead of a son, like all of these little things, just acknowledging that because of the color of my skin, which was not a choice by me, it's just how I was born that there are additional things that we fear on a regular basis because of the way that this country has grown and evolved. And I think that is just in a basis, the first step to acknowledging that. It's, it's like really identifying the privilege that white men and women have. It doesn't mean that your life was perfect because there's so many things that happen in life that really do have positive and negative impact in lives. But just knowing that like 
man, like this has nothing to do with my family. It has nothing to do with how I grew up. It has everything to do with the fact that I am a specific color and the way that black people have been treated essentially since we were brought over on slave ships in the early 1600s, I think was like the very first um, enslaved folks that were brought over here. Like just acknowledging that I think makes a big difference. And then the civil rights movement wasn't that long ago. Like my mom was an adult when all of, all of the major civil rights movement was happening. My mom's still alive. Like, it's not like she's a, she was like a hundred years old today. Like this stuff is still happening and it's very deeply rooted. So just literally saying and acknowledging it also, um, just chipping away at it one piece at a time, like speaking up against or speaking up for people of color, um, specifically the black community. But when they're basically what I'm trying to say is when there isn't a black person around to speak up for themselves and someone says something, say something. Call it you know, out. Yeah, exactly. Call it out. Just like simple everyday things because those are the real problems. I think the gut, like systemic racism is a huge problem that does need to change, but it won't really change until we change the mindset of the people who live in this country. So. Yeah. Um, for me, I am a very empathic person and it's very easy for me to um, acknowledge and um, feel into the pain and suffering of others regardless of what the source is. Um, but for people who are not that way, um, I think it might be helpful to bring attention to the very um, valid scientific study of epigenetics, which um, says that basically trauma is passed down through DNA from generation to generation. And so when people want to say that, um, you know, people of color today, well, you're not slaves that's not your reality. Um, white people want to say, I never held a slave. My family didn't hold slaves. I'm not responsible. Um, I think it's relevant to look at that and say, um, regardless of what our uh, current life situations are, that mm -hmm. we can all acknowledge that the slavery that has happened in this country has been passed down through genetic trauma. And to me, I cannot witness someone else's suffering without responding as a witness. And I think that just being a witness all by itself is very, very healing for people. It's not mm -hmm. that I'm going to erase your pain. It's not that I can take it away from you. It's not that I can resolve it for anyone or anybody, but it means that I can be here and I can witness what's happened that we have all witnessed, whether we like it or not, because we've witnessed it through history books. We, even, if, even if the history we were taught is faulty or inaccurate, we mm -hmm. all are aware of it. It really did happen. It's not an illusion. It's not a delusion. This is a part of our history. And so we can take responsibility for it in that sense that the goal now is to try to meet some of that trauma and meet some of that pain and just hold space for it and just witness it and just be with people and not try to dictate to others how they should express that pain. Yeah. So. 
it's not beneficial to say that looters are making the cause look terrible. Like, in all honesty, I mean, I have not looted anything, <laughs> but I'm not going to judge the actions of others. And a lot of them are people trying to rile up crowds, but exactly like if you feel the need to speak, if you feel the need to dance, if you feel the need to break things, I'm not going to judge what you need as a human being to work on healing yourself. I think that's something that this whole world struggles with is this understanding of feelings as a whole and why we have all these different feelings and how we would express them. And I think that especially in the black community, it's like weighted so heavily, especially for black men, you're not allowed to feel anything. You're just supposed to go be independent, you know, don't really build relationships and women are supposed to be strong and strong is the feeling. It's not really a feeling, but apparently it is. And yeah, exactly. It's just like, we don't know how to express how we feel inside because we don't know how we feel inside so often because we're not really taught to be able to identify those things. And like you were saying, I just think of the movie Inside Out because I just watched it recently. Um, and joy is like, I don't know, sadness is point, you know, blah, 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 like the whole movie. But near the end, she notices a moment where Riley is sad because I think she, I don't remember what happened, but she was sad and her parents were sad with her. They were holding space with her. And then she was able to pick up and move on. And I was like, as you were saying, I'm like, yeah, exactly. You're not saying, you're not fixing it. You're just letting that person feel. And then they can decide when they're ready to pick themselves back up and continue on. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I love that Dr. Uh, Kemp brought up was um, the importance of using self-love and self-care. And this is direct, she directed this to white people, which I thought was interesting. Now, obviously, everyone needs to practice self-love and self-care, and it's obviously easier mm -hmm. said than done. But her spin on it was really interesting to me because what she was bringing out was that if white people come from a space of self-love and self-care, then when they are called out for hidden biases, and hidden is an important word because I think there are very few people who walk around consciously you know, as conscious racists. But what right. happens is we have hidden biases that we're not even aware of. And this is just a product of our programming and social conditioning. It doesn't mean we're terrible people. It just means there's something we were blind to because it wasn't part of our experience, right? And so when someone can bring to attention something that we weren't aware of because it wasn't part of our experience, rather than meeting that with defensiveness, rather than meeting that with you're calling me a racist rather than meeting with that with what are you talking about i love everybody and you know i have black friends and you know why are you directing this at me if we have come from a place of self love and self care then we don't hold people responsible for making us feel better when we mm -hmm. are called out for those things and i thought it was really beautiful the way that she illustrated that and I thought it was a perfect way to sort of return the conversation to where it needs to be, which is internal. Now, of course, having external conversations is very important. Yeah. But um, I'm curious what you think about that. I, I want to just share really quickly, she said, the foundation of truth, we need to cultivate self-love because if we don't have enough self-love, with which to greet our own faults. We cannot be honest with ourselves or other people. Absolutely. I think like this whole conversation at the end of the day is just basics on 
how to love yourself and how to cater to all your relationships but it's like a broader scope and I I really like that thought of you really have to love yourself before you can come in or receive external feedback and not be defensive about it and like I feel like that's true even for any bias that you were just saying I think I love it (laughs) it's essentially what I'm trying to say I think it's very thoughtful and like yeah we all need to love ourselves and then when we do get feedback we won't have to be so defensive in that feedback and especially with um white folks not feel feeling like oh well i'm a race you're calling me a racist and being defensive and yeah losing track making about them i think that's one of the phrases i've been saying a lot and i know christine doesn't like the term karen but i i I still kind of use it but what a karen does is essentially making it about them and that's self-love is realizing it's not about you it's about this groove and then when you reflect inside you can think about you because we always need to love ourselves but realizing our own biases to then break that bias and then put it back into the community as a whole to make it about everyone as well I also like, um, I had written down that she said self-love allows us to grow rather than fall apart when we do get called out and then have following that up with self-forgiveness. So none of it is meant to make people feel guilty or responsible for things that are not their responsibility, right? right? It's all about stepping into someone else's shoes just for a minute and seeing things from a different set of eyes. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Obviously I'm white, blonde and blue eyed. So, um, (laughs) really (laughs) sometimes I'm qualified to speak about, um, things. Now there is the sense too of, there are a lot of bleeding heart empaths out there. And sometimes what I see are white women having breakdowns because they're overwhelmed by what they perceive of as the collective pain uh, for people of color and things like that. And they literally break down to the point where they don't want to get up and face the day. And I've noticed this And I've actually seen certain people within the black community kind of hinting that, you know, we don't need white people to fall apart for us. And Dr. Kemp touched on this a little bit too, that what happens is in those situations, it's like now all of a sudden the white people are so hurt and pained that they need to be repaired, they need care for, they need to be healed. And it's like, okay, but again, it's kind of an almost an appropriation or usurpation Hmm. of, of this pain that, again, being a witness to versus having direct experience. I just wonder if you have anything to share about that or if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I do have thoughts. I'm not sure how to say them. Um, Yeah, like I get, I'm an empath. So I do find that I easily start taking on the feelings of others. And it's overwhelming. And like, I'm like, I get that perspective. Um, But I just, I guess I want to add, well, I have like three thoughts. So the first thought is my focus in all of this is really mental health, especially as part of Asclepios. Man, that's like the high priority in self-care, which really does include self-love. And I think being, 
I'm trying to meet people where they are. Um, so I'm not, if, if someone does like fall apart from all the stress and anxiety of the whole world, which it is so overwhelming. So much has happened in the past. So much is happening today. So much is happening tomorrow or will happen tomorrow. And like, yeah, we, the black community doesn't need that, <laughs> but I also get like it happens because we're all human beings and we can be overwhelmed by many things. Like I'm not part of uh, the LGBTQ plus community, but I've definitely felt the sorrow and pain of people who have had to hide who they are their whole lives because they risk getting uh, lashed out at in their own families, which is crazy to me. Um, or just living in a small town where they'll just be judged and they could be killed. Like that, that's a huge risk as well. And it's like, I know it's not my place though, to put it on the LGBT community for how I feel. So my like second, third point is absolutely like we don't need that kind of support because we've been required to stay strong, be strong, keep fighting, hide how we feel, um, really not care for ourselves and love ourselves, which is why that's why I'm so focused on that. So if people who are empaths are feeling super run down and depressed because of the situation, my recommendation is to go care for yourself, put your mask on first before you help the black community. And, you know, again, don't make it about you. It's about the community. It's not even about me. It's about the community. So, you know, when you struggle, we all struggle and that's okay. And we don't have to fight 24 seven, even though that is the tone that we have to constantly be fighting I want us to all be able to take a break. If we don't need a break, great. If we do need a break, we need to take a break. And we all need to acknowledge that. So black, white, the whole rainbow of colors, <laughs> we should all learn to care for ourselves. Like to me, the summation of this conversation and maybe the session that you had is if we love ourselves, we will take care of ourselves. We will forgive ourselves for our mistakes and we acknowledge the humanity of who we are. And when we do that, we build up our own confidence and we fill our own strength so that we can give to the community, to whatever community we call it the black community, white community, Los Angeles, Orange County, like whatever community that you can give back to in a positive way is where you can go. So I feel like at the end of the day, it always goes down to self-care and self-love. And it's just the application of all of those things on the issues that we're experiencing today. Right, yeah, thank you. Um, and I'm gonna, um, that's gonna bring me to a point of a, another thing that Dr. Kemp's shared in her webinar. She shared the quote that hurt people, hurt people, mm. transformed people, transform people. And I loved that follow up. And I think that resonates with what you're saying in that if someone wants to approach a community and their intention is to help, but they're helping from the place of their own pain and damage before they've done the self-care. Yes. Inadvertently, it will only wind up hurting others. Mm -hmm. Even with the best of intentions. Yes. But when we are coming from a place of healing ourselves, then we do have the potential for that healing to have the ripple effect that comes out into the community. Exactly. Yeah. 
Is there anything you else you would like to share or bring bring to light or any other thoughts? Um, I just with that last quote, hurt people, hurt people. I just felt it's so true. And like, that's kind of why I was saying for the black community, we need to lift ourselves up and build ourselves up and like own our own pain. Because I like, there's this fine line, like we ought to meet people where they are. So there's got to be some level of forgiveness for non-Black people to forgive Black people for the experience they have because it's painful, it's raw, it's rough. We don't all know how to express ourselves. But also the hurt people, the Black community, we need to heal ourselves as well. And so that's why I, th I thought that was really interesting. And that's why I'm like, I see now... I grew up in Orange County, so I had like, it was mostly white, but my perspective was always to have a wide range of people from different cultures and backgrounds, but there's so much benefit to building your own community of your own race that's supportive and loving, of your gender that you identify with, and then just a mixture of everything. But as a Black community, like I said, I want us to learn to love ourselves and care for ourselves and find healing in all the pain that has happened that we see day to day. Uh, we hear about day to day. It's in our genetics, you know, that's been passed on for generations and generations. It's so important to work on healing that pain and hurt so that we can lift up others, lift ourselves up, lift up others, and even in other cultures and backgrounds and things like that as well. And I just feel a need to qualify because um, I can imagine how uh, what I just said might be received by some people. I don't think that it's necessary that a person be hurt free, pain free, or totally yes. <laughs> healed to be able to offer, um, you know, the to be able to be present and offer healing to others. But what's important is, again, it's coming from that place of self-love. Mm. And you can still be hurt. You can still be damaged. You can still be growing. But if you have the self-love there, then all of those things happen and unfold in ways that can only bring yourself and everyone else up with you versus coming from a place of um, fear and self-judgment and um, mm. defensiveness and things like that, which will ultimately um, deepen the wounds. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%, I agree with that. I think that's a good clarification. We're all hurting in some way. Everyone needs healing yep. and no one's ever done healing. The work is never done. It's never complete. That's the human experience, right? Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sarah. No problem. Oh, I know what else I want to say. Um, I wanted to thank you for having this conversation with me. And to talk about how Dr. Kemp made a point um, to really clarify that it's very important to get consent before having conversations like these. Mm. That sometimes well-meaning white people will look at a person of color and just assume that that person represents all people of color and kind of throw at them like, hey, so, you know, what's it like for you being a Black person? Tell me about, you know, this or that. And those kinds of um, inquisitions, if you will, are actually still designed to assuage and make the white person feel better. 
rather mm -hmm. than meeting that person um, where they're at. And so she really stressed the importance of asking people, is it okay if I talk to you about your perspective as a person of color and what it's like for you and how I can support you, right? Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. I think that's really great. I think that's valuable for just getting that permission for any aspect. Again, like I feel like we're just talking about relationships here and we're applying it to color, but I think that's very thoughtful and I think that's important to acknowledge as well. Get that consent. Yeah. And so thank you for consenting to this conversation. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Well, I think um, it's probably a conversation we could carry on for a very long time. Yes. <laughs> but um, definitely worthy. And I appreciate you showing up. Thank you. This is a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Okay. You take care. Bye, Rebecca. Bye.